I'm honored to welcome back Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni to Google. Her accomplishments as an author are far-reaching. Her short story collection, Arrange Marriage, won an American Book Award in 1995. And two novels, The Mistress of Spices and Sister of My Heart, were adapted into film recently as well. Her work's also been published in over 50 magazines, including The Atlantic Monthly, and The New Yorker, and her writing has been included in over 50 anthologies, including Best American Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, and The Pushcart Prize Anthology. Her fan base is global, with her work being translated into 20 languages, including Dutch, Hebrew, Indonesian, and Japanese. And apart from being a celebrated author, she is professor of creative writing at the University of Houston. On a personal note, as a woman, mother, daughter, and friend with a strong interest in the experience of the Southeast Asian community, I've been drawn to Chitra's work. Her books have become favorites. For me, her stories fully immerse the reader in her character's journey, joys, struggles, and triumphs. Be it rallying for success or sharing in the pain of a troubled experience, her style brings the reader deep into the moments, and at times it feels like you can see, taste, and hear the sounds that are described in the book. She's been hailed by Abraham Varghese as a gifted storyteller and by People Magazine as a skilled cartographer of the heart, and I completely plus one this sentiment. And I'm uberly excited to hear experts from this latest work, or Oleander Girl and learned recently over lunch that we are very privileged to be the first ones hearing this here in Google because um, this is a pre-launch. It's actually the first place she's reading here in California and it's being officially launched tomorrow. So please join me in welcoming Chitra, Banerjee Devakarun. Thank you, Regina. Thank you for inviting me back to Google. It is such a pleasure to be here. It's, it's always exciting and wonderful. And I always say that if I were a techie, this is where I would want to work. <laughs> so I'm in the happy position of actually having two books that are coming out in the, at the same time. I'll be talking about Oleander Girl, but I just wanted to show everyone this book, which is my first children's picture book. And it's called Grandma and the Great Gourd. And it is the retelling of a Bengali folk tale my grandfather used to tell me when I was little and I was growing up in India. So it's very exciting for me to share this book with other people, uh, people who speak English and who might want to share the culture with their children. And this is Oleander Girl. You heard that it's just come out, so it's an exciting time. It's kind of a scary time because, you know, you put your baby out there in the world and you wait to see what other people are going to say. And interestingly, this too is a family story. It is a story that uh, talks about a grandfather and a granddaughter, among other things. This is a book, a novel about love, not just romantic love, but although that is there, but really human love. And it's about difference. It's about how do we live in the world, which is a multicultural world, an increasingly global world. How do we live there with people who believe differently about things, who have different ideologies or ways of life or religions? How can we live in friendship and in love? This book is set in 2002 which, as I'm sure you know, was an important year for, in many places of the world. In America, it was post 9-11. We were really getting into understanding what were the long-term effects of 9-11, um, not just on the families who had lost people, but on Americans overall, and especially brown-skinned Americans who looked quote-unquote different, who looked quote-unquote dangerous. 2002 is also the year of the Godhra riots in India, terrible Hindu-Muslim riots, the repercussions of which you know, uh, went all across the country to Kolkata, which is 
the city where the book is set in India, which is also my city where I was born and spent many years. So those are some of the things that I tried to bring together in Oleander Girl. Oleander Girl is also about the fast changing nature of India itself. Because in Kolkata, as I've experienced it, and maybe some of you have experienced it in other places, the old and the new clash up against each other. India is changing so fast, and yet it has such a strong tradition. What happens when you push them up against each other? So this is the story of a young woman from a very traditional Indian family who has been brought up by her grandparents and who falls in love with a young man from a very different kind of family. Her fiancé, Rajat, comes from a new India. Their family is new money. And what happens when you try to put those families together is part of what the story of Oleander Girl is about. I'm going to read to you a little bit from the beginning. The story begins the night before Korubi, the main character, her engagement ceremony. As I said, she lives in a very traditional household in an old, old mansion, and there's a temple in their family grounds. That's where the engagement ceremony will take place. But this is the night before. This part is in Korubi's voice. The book is told in many voices. As a writer, I'm always interested in how the teller of the story changes the tale. So different parts will be seen in the eyes of different people. This is Karabi's voice. I'm swimming through a long underwater cavern flecked with blue light, the cavern of love, with Rajut close behind me. We're in a race, and so far I'm winning because this is my dream. Sometimes when I'm dreaming, I don't know it, but tonight I do. I smile and feel my mouth filling with cool silver bubbles. Rajut's fingers brush the backs of my knees. Even in my dream, I know that if I slow down just a bit, he'll grab my waist and pull me to him for a mischievous kiss. Imagining that kiss sends a shudder of pleasure through me. Then, out of nowhere, a wave breaks over me. Salt and sand are on my tongue. I try to spit them out, but they fill my mouth, choking me. Where's Rajat when I need his help? Gasping, I thrash about and wake in my bed, tangled in my bedclothes. As my eyes adjust to the darkness, I know at once that someone is in the room. It's impossible. I always lock the door before going to sleep, and the window is barred. But there it is, in the armchair in the corner of the night room, a still female form, black against the darkness of the room, looking toward me. Mother, I whisper, my fear replaced by a yearning that's as old and as illogical as anything I can remember. I know so little about my mother, only that she died 18 years ago, giving birth to me. A few months after my father, an ambitious law student, had passed away in a car accident. Perhaps she died of a broken heart. I never knew for sure because no one would speak to me of them. My grandfathers had to put aside their own broken hearts to care for me, and I'm grateful they did it well. Still, all through my years growing up, I longed for a visitation from my mother. Now, years after I had armored my heart and accepted that my mother was gone from my life, here she is. How can I be sure it is her? There are some things we know in our breath, in our bones. So, Karvi begins to think about why her mother might have come to see her on this night, and she figures it's because she, her life is about to change. She's about to get engaged, she's entering adulthood, she's going to become part of a different family. Maybe her mother is concerned and wants to know 
if she's going to be all right. So she begins reassuring her mother. She begins telling her about Rajut, what a wonderful man he is, how much she loves him, how much he loves her. But when she finishes speaking, she feels something is not quite right. I'm breathless from my confession, but still the air in the room hangs uncertain, incomplete. My mother continues to look out the window. Why will she not speak to me? Where is the blessing kiss I've wanted all my life, cool as a dew-drenched breeze on my forehead? Suddenly, the window behind her is filled with light. Outside, I see an ocean over which a sun is setting. Have I fallen then from one dream into another? She points over the ocean, leaning toward it with such sad longing that sorrow twists my heart. I understand. She hasn't come to learn about me. All the things I said to her, she probably knew them already, being dead. She has appeared now instead to tell me something. But what? Talk to me, mother. This time when she turns to me, I notice that my dream mother has no mouth. Her frame shivers with effort as though she longs to speak. She begins to dissolve. I can glimpse the ocean through her tattered body, waves breaking apart on rocks. An urgent sorrow radiates from her disappearing form. Then she's gone, and I'm finally awake, blinking in the first rays of the sun, entering the room through the bars. So Carby is really concerned, and she wants to understand what this means. And she decides that even though her grandparents don't like to talk about her mother, she's got to ask her grandmother about this night visit. And I'll read to you what happens. So this is after the engagement ceremony, and you know, her grandmother has just cleared up everything and said, go lie down because there's going to be a big party in the evening and you should, you should rest. Grandma, wait, I've got to talk to you. I blurt out the words because there's no good way to say them. Someone was in my room last night. I think it was my mother. I wait for grandmother to dismiss my foolish notions with a laugh and send me off, but she pales and takes a step back. The crystal dish falls from her hand and shatters. Tiny silver balls go flying over the veranda. Why do you think that, she whispers. I felt it. Even to my ears, my answer sounds weak, but grandmother accepts it. Her hands are trembling. Did it, did she say anything to you? I shake my head, disconcerted. I had no idea that my pragmatic grandmother believed so strongly in ghosts. But even if she did, why would the thought of her dead daughter's spirit agitate her like this? I realize I don't want to know the answer. Maybe I imagined it, I say. Maybe you did, grandmother says, but without conviction. I'll go lie down now. You do that, she says. You rest too. Yes, she says. But when I look back from the doorway, she's still standing among the broken glass, scattered cardamom seeds surrounding her like a field of frozen tears. So that's the beginning of Oleander Girl. And now things are going to change very rapidly in Corby's life because her grandfather, whom she loves dearly, is going to die all of a sudden of a heart attack. And when he dies, she will realize that he's kept a secret from her all her life. And this secret will change her whole notion of who she is. It will shake up her sense of identity. And she's going to have to put off her wedding and come to America on a search. And what she discovers is part of the story of Oleander Girl. 
But Oleander Girl is not just Corby's story. It's also the story of Rajut, who is left behind. And this is kind of a turning around of the hero's journey, which is a mythic theme that I used for this book. Because generally in the hero's journey, the man goes off to war or to adventure, and the woman is the one who's left behind. Well, in this case, Rajat is going to be left behind, although he will have his own adventures because right around this time is when the Godra riots happen. And the, as I said, the repercussions will be felt all the way across the country, and especially in Rajat's family's warehouse where Hindus and Muslims work together. So this is, as I was, you know, a lot of times when I'm writing a story, uh, people ask me, where do the story ideas come from? Is it something out of your own life? And with like my previous book, which also I came here to Google to present, one amazing thing, there was an actual occurrence when we were being evacuated from Houston, where I live, because a huge hurricane was coming. And you know we were stuck on the freeway in this massive, massive traffic jam. The hurricane was coming right at us. And all of us strangers in a life-threatening situation began to panic. And that's really what gave me the idea for one amazing thing where something similar happens. But with this one, I really wasn't sure of any one thing in my life. It was just ideas, thoughts, things that I felt strongly about that went into this book. But as I wrote it, I realized something because you know, a lot of times our writing comes out of our subconscious and we don't even know until we finish writing it where it came from. And as I was writing this book, almost towards the end, I realized in some ways, this is really my take on my own family story. Not that exactly the same things happened, but I too, when I was in college, I realized that my family had a secret that they had kept from me. And that had involved my grandfather. And it had involved the fact that long before I was born, he disinherited one of my uncles. And I won't go into that story, but somewhere in my mind, in my heart, where I really loved my grandfather very much, this had created a major conflict. How could the man that I loved so much have done something like that to his own son? And I could never understand it. But I think this book allowed me to explore that, although the actual secret here and what the grandfather has done is, a, is different. But it was also a secret. And it was something that when Korubi finds out, she is devastated that her grandfather could do something like this and keep this secret from her. And so I think one of the things that's at the heart of this book is what do you do when people that you love dearly, you discover something about them that you can't agree with and you can't come to terms with? It's also about how family secrets are often, they really reflect on the culture around them what is considered shameful? What is considered not okay for the family? What has to be kept hidden? And what is the result of that which we keep hidden from people when they find out about it? So anyway, that's a little bit about, one, uh, about Oleander Girl. And if you have questions, of course, I'd be very happy to answer them, especially if they're easy questions. And as you're thinking of questions, I'm going to say one more thing, which is, you know, I just want to tell you, you probably hear this from authors all the time, but like Google has improved my life so much. It has had such <laughs> a positive influence on my research. It has just made a world of difference. So I really want to thank Google for that, where, you know, I can just find things out just like this through Google. So. Thank you. The question, which is, have I ever been sad to say goodbye to a character? Have I ever brought anyone back? Well, you know, you mentioned in the introduction, Sister of My Heart, which has gone on to become a film. And that was the one book where, at the end of the book, the book is about two cousins, Sudha and Anju. They're very close. And they go through a lot of life's 
tribulations together. They help each other. They're also in a conflict sometimes. But at the end of Sister of My Heart, I kind of knew their story wasn't done. Somewhere deep down. Because in the beginning of the book, they're in India. Then they're separated through their weddings and their marriages. And then they come together in America. And at first, I'd thought that that was the end. That was the arc of their friendship and their closeness to each other. But then as time went along, I knew they had a whole new story, an immigrant story in America, where now, because they were in a different place, their relationship was different. Because sometimes that's what happens through immigration. Your relationship with people around you changes. Your notion of yourself changes. So that's the one. They came back in a different novel, The Vine of Desire. And every once in a while, I think, maybe they'll come back one more time. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to Google. I'm really excited to read the book. Um, I have a question about film adaptations. Uh, so I've watched Mistress of Spices. I haven't watched the other adaptations. How involved are you with them? Um, do you have to let go? Do you feel like you still have ownership over the content and get mad at them? Or how does that, how does that work? That's a great question. The question is about film adaptations uh, about my book. And um, now, now I've had Mistress of Spices made into film, Sister of My Heart, a short story from Arranged Marriage titled The Word Love that was made into a bilingual film, English and Bengali, called Amar Ma, and actually won uh, some awards at Cannes. And right now, one amazing thing has been optioned by Hollywood, and they've finished writing the screenplay, so we're kind of excited to see what the next step will be. Well, a uh, short answer what, uh, to what control do I have? Like, none. <laughs> well, you know, um, and, and actually, I don't really want control because it would be like if I were trying to write a book and someone was telling me what to do, right? So if I am trying to tell the director what they should do with the book, that's really interfering with their artistic freedom. So I'm perfectly okay with, if I like the director, I'm perfectly okay with letting them have their vision. And I realized, uh, right with Mistress of Spices, which when I was, uh, when I was reading the screenplay, you know, that was made by a wonderful pro producing couple, uh, Gurinder Chadha, who made Bend It for Beckham, and her husband, Paul Burgess. And they had showed it. I was very involved as in they would show me everything as they were doing it. They would call me and ask me questions. They came and stayed out here in California with me for a while while they were discussing the project and getting a vision. So I was very involved that way. And I could see that they were moving away from the book. The romantic story, which is part of the book, was becoming really important. And I could see why, because they'd already picked the heroine, Aishwarya Rai, who is, as you know, who's been called the most beautiful woman in the world. And, you know, they wanted the camera on her. <laughs> and I think they did a great job. And lots of people really loved the movie. I love many parts of the movie. It's different from the book, because the book is kind of an immigrant story. It's the stories of all the people who come to the store where the Mistress of Spices lives and works, and she helps them by giving them spices. So that part became smaller, and the romantic part became larger in the movie. And I realized that, you know, that's when I realized the movie is their work, the book is my work, and it's perfectly all right. And what I think the wonderful thing that does happen with the movie is a lot of people will see the movie, then they'll come back and read the book. And if they love the movie, that's great. They'll come and read the book. And if they read the book and they like the book better, am I going to complain? <laughs> but So I'm excited to see what will happen with one amazing thing. They're hoping to make it a joint venture between Hollywood and India. So they're looking for people on both sides. And they're looking for some money. So you know, all you Google people, if you have money and you don't know what to do with it, <laughs> come see me afterwards. Um, you mentioned in the book that uh, it's told partly from Korobi's viewpoint and then later from R Rajat's viewpoint. Did you have any trouble switching between the two, as in like a male versus female voice? 
Yeah, that's a good question too. The question is about the different viewpoints in the book. I read to you the part in Corby's voice, which is in first person, and the question is, did I have trouble switching? Um, it took me, it takes me a while, you know, to get the voice. And then once I've figured out the voice in the later parts of the novel, I won't have trouble switching. But in the early part, I would have to try like several times. The thing about this book is it's in first person and third person. So Karubi gets the first person where she's saying, I feel this, I think this. But the other parts, Rajut's voice, um, Karubi's grandmother, Sharojini's voice, they're all third person. So it's what they're thinking and what they're feeling. So there's a little more distance. There's a little more chance for the reader to come and interpret what's happening. So that was the difference. And one of the voices that I became really fond of and that kind of surprised me as the novel went along is Rajut's family chauffeur, Asif's voice. And he became really important in the story, and he brings in a different religious angle because he's Muslim, and he struggles with, uh, especially when the Godra riots are going on, with the idea that he's a Muslim, he's working for a Hindu, and you know he has some trouble with that idea when all of this uh, interracial violence, interreligious violence is going on. So that was an interesting voice that I had to really work at, but then I became very happy with that voice. So, but that's a great question. And I think part of your question is, is it harder to write the male voice than the female voice? For me, it is. I have to work much harder at the male voice. The female voice just comes naturally to me. But with the male voice, I have to think about it. I have to listen to it. Uh, fortunately, in my home, I have lots of opportunity because my home is made up of my husband and my two sons. So it's all male voices. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming today. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask who some of your favorite authors are and maybe if there are any authors who have inspired you. Who are they? Yes, who are some of my favorite authors who have inspired me? Truly, I have been inspired by so many authors because I came to writing late and I had already finished all my formal education. I was already working by the time I started writing. And so most of what I learned were from books, were from authors. And I've been particularly influenced by multicultural contemporary women's voices. So. Uh, one of the writers that I love and I reread quite often is Toni Morrison. And, you know, just I love the way she's taken the African American experience and she's just made it available to everyone without diluting it. And that's something I really aim for. I want to create the Indian or Indian American experience. I want to invite other people into it, but I don't want to dilute it. I want to make it the way it is, real. And so, her and Maxine Hong Kingston, a Bay Area writer who, who writes wonderfully about the Chinese American experience. She has a book called The Woman Warrior that I read when I was in college, when I was going to Berkeley. And I think that book really changed my life and it made me see my own immigration experience differently. And it also made me think that, yes, it's possible for me to write the stories of the people that I see around me that large immigration story of which I too am a part. So those are two that I love. And for the men sitting in this audience, I do read men authors, guys. <laughs> and and um, one of the Indian authors that I love is Amitav Ghosh. I think he is just such a fine writer. I've learned a lot from reading his books. And, uh, and uh, a Caucasian author that I have loved a lot is Tim O'Brien who has a wonderful collection of stories, Vietnam stories. And I just love, 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 love those stories. Yes. I'm, I'm always curious about where uh, writers go to put together their creative process. Like, is there, do you feel as though you need to take yourself away from your day to day and like take time to go somewhere? Or um, do you find that the, the magic of what's happening in the household actually <laughs> helps contribute. How is it for you when you're writing a new book? Well, that's, that's also a great question, Regina, because 
Well, you know, as as a mother, especially when my children were young, mothers who are writers don't have that option of going away. <laughs> you have to do your writing right in the middle of everything. So I would do my writing when my children took naps or when they went to nursery school or later when they went to regular school. Those were my writing hours. And pretty much all I needed was a quiet space. I needed a quiet space where I would not be disturbed. But more than that, really, I couldn't hope for because, you know, my family was there and my family was important to me. So a quiet space, um, I had to, like, organize my schedule as intelligently as I could. So maybe I would write late in the night or when the children were at school. And that's how I did it. In fact, I think if I went away somewhere, I would be so distracted by, you know, people sometimes say, don't you need to go to like a beautiful space to write? And I'm like, no, in my, in my study, I face a blank wall. And that's how I write best because I'm not distracted by anything. <laughs> thank you all so much. It's so wonderful to come to Google. And really, thank you for taking time out of your busy days to come. Enjoy the book with me.